All right, we're at time, and uh, I know we're tightly scheduled here, and especially if anyone actually shows up on Zoom, if you've been doing those right at the, as soon as it hits the top of the hour, it shuts them down, um, mid-word, because uh, I've gone through a couple of them, and folks have been, actually one of them was saying thank, and you didn't even get the U at the end, that was lost. Uh, so I'm Mike Barber, I'm at Torrey University, California, and let me, I guess this is the one being displayed, not mine, so let me hide that. And my colleague. All right. There we go. Uh, my colleague, Randy Labonte, uh, who's the CEO of the Canadian Learn Network, is up in uh, beautiful British Columbia right now. Uh, wasn't able to make a trip. Actually, they had a conference there that ended on um, the day this one started. So that's why he wasn't able to join us. So I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the pandemic. And when we submitted this, we called it the first 18 months because we hadn't written the last um, report that we had done. We've actually done another report since then. So if I had a chance again, I would have just gotten rid of the first 18 months or extended the 18 to, I guess, 30 now is where we're to. Um, there we go. Before we begin, or before I get to the pandemic stuff, I want to make sure folks, because I'm guessing most of the folks, I know uh, we've got at least one Canadian here, but many folks might not be familiar with the, what is happening in online learning in Canada at the K-12 level. Uh, we have had this study for the last, I guess this is the 15th year that it's coming out now. Uh, it's the State of the Nation K-12 e-learning in Canada. You can see the URL uh, up at the top. Um, we've got 14 reports thus far, but uh, what we found over time is that there's a lot of activity happening in Canada, much more so than most people understand, and in many cases, much more than what we see in the US. Uh, most of the provinces have either a provincial system or a district based system. Uh, in some cases, they've got a, a combination of both, and that seems to be changing over time. Uh, so BC is an example as primarily a district based system. They're moving to a centralized model actually this year. Uh, Saskatchewan only announced, what, two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, that they're going to follow suit on that model. Uh, they've had a similar thing happening in Ontario, uh, so it's changing all the time. In terms of the level of activity, we've got some jurisdictions that actually have a lot of online learning happening, uh, even prior to the pandemic. So most of the online learning that happens, happens at the high school level, but you can see the proportion of just all K-12 students on the far side there that are actually engaged. And there's several provinces that have more than 10% of all of their students that have at least one online course. In fact, Ontario just implemented a mandate that requires them to have two online courses in order to graduate from high school. A mandate came into effect actually last year. Uh, so that number will eventually be 100% at some point, and you can see, you know, there's 2 million uh, K-12 students in Ontario. Um, now, this is a formalized online learning, and I'm sure most of the folks here are familiar with, with Chuck's, uh, Chuck Hodge's work in Educause Review, distinguishing the differences between online learning and emergency remote learning or just remote learning in general, and I have no idea why that keeps clicking out on us like that. Oh yeah, it's going blue and red there now, and now it's not doing anything. It was green earlier. Oh, perfect. All right. Um, so you can see the URL there at the bottom to get all of those reports. Uh, we've got them all posted up there, but we've been trying to do them at each of the signposts. 
So the gray one is sort of the original one where we delineated and made in more K-12 version Chuck's work, and actually Chuck was one of the co-authors on that. Uh, the green one was looking at what happened in the fall, or sorry, spring of 2020. The orange one was looking at fall 2020 preparations. Uh, the red one we put out around Christmas of 2020, where we were collecting narratives from stakeholders throughout the, uh, the, the system. Uh, the yellow one was at the end of the 2020-21 school year. Then we did a blue one that came out that looked at the fall 2021 preparations. And now this purple one's coming out that's looked at primarily what happened during the 21-22 school year. Oh, I don't know why that blue one just decided to pop in there, but that's it. Um, and what they've really focused upon is this idea of, of remote teaching. And um, I want to distinguish a little bit between emergency remote and remote. Emergency remote is what happened in the spring. It's like, oh crap, what are we going to do? What happened in the fall would still be remote. You know, we put in place plans that weren't meant to be permanent. They were meant to just be a temporary solution for as long as this thing happened. Now, in theory, they should have been a little bit more planned than what happened in the spring. Um, they could have been planned as well as you would have an online program, but unfortunately weren't. Now, if you look at our response thread, and if you haven't seen this graphic before, it's originally done by Phil Hill uh, and uh, in uh, Mindshares or MindWires Learning, sorry. And um, it's a really useful idea because as you're looking at it, essentially, phase one is what happened in the spring. As the spring progressed and as people got a little bit more comfortable and as we started to get ready for the fall, that's where we went into phase two. Now, phase three should be a state where, still jumping around like that. Phase three should be a state where you can switch back and forth between the online and the face-to-face -face without losing any continuity of learning or any quality of instruction. Some people have referred to it as a toggle term. And then phase four is basically what's going to happen when we're out of this. And I say out of this eventually because I don't think we are out of it yet, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, one of the things that we found was that, uh, and I'll sort of give away the ending, we don't think anyone really got to phase three in higher ed or in K-12, personally speaking, but we just focused upon Canada and K-12 in this one. Um, but that idea of being able to be in class on Friday afternoon, get a note sometime before last period that says, okay, next week we're gonna start online and being able to start up on Monday morning without any loss of the quality or continuity of instruction that's happening. I'd love to see any program anywhere in the world that was able to achieve that level of fidelity because it just hasn't happened. Um, it could have, but it hasn't. Um, so if we look at where we were prior to COVID, there was a lot of ability for programs to be able to do quite well in this respect. We had a lot of jurisdictions that had centralized LMSs at the provincial level that all teachers and students had access to. We had a number of problems, actually every province had some online content done, usually mostly for the most of the high school curriculum was done. In many cases, multiple versions of it. As you saw, we had 10% and higher in four of the jurisdictions that were taking online learning at the time. Um, you know, so there was a lot of experience ready for this. It's something that we could have been quite well at. And even when you look at the amount of time that happened between when schools closed and when they reopened for remote learning, in most cases, you're looking at two to four weeks. And again, with the resources that we had, they should have done a better job in the spring of putting that together. Now, what they ended up doing in most cases, and, and you know, as teacher educators, some of this is kind of really disheartening, but only four of the 15 or 13 jurisdictions actually provided any form te formal teacher professional development for educators in the spring of 2020. I mean, can you imagine that? We shut down the entire system. We have a period of two to four weeks. They're all on contract during that time. And nine of the 13 departments of education couldn't be bothered to even throw together a website that would provide some basic professional development for their teachers. Um, and as you can see, some of the other things that they provided there, and these are all out of the report, so I won't get into them. I'll skip over that. Um, so as we start looking towards what's going to happen in the fall, we had some of the jurisdictions that closed early, which gave them the opportunity to use that contracted teacher time to provide additional professional development, to get in place tools and content 
for their faculty or for their teachers. The same thing we had about half of the jurisdictions that delayed their fall opening. Again, teachers were still on contract, so we had that ability to provide time for professional development, to provide time to get devices out, to get plans in place. Um, but what you'll find is that in most cases, they basically hoped and prayed that they would be able to go back to face-to-face -face learning and then made the assumption that what they had learned in the spring would be enough to carry them through any disruptions that would happen during the fall or during the 2020-21 school year. What we saw actually happening, you know, we had these traditional distance and online programs, and then they planned for in-person. And in some cases, actually in most cases, they planned for the regular classroom environment. Some of them did uh, a concurrent teaching model where we've seen a lot of this happening even higher ed. I've got half of the class in front of me and I've got half that are watching online. Uh, we saw other ones where they were a more of a true hybrid model where I had, I was teaching my in class in the class. I had also prepared lessons to be done online and you might do Monday and Tuesday in the classroom, Wednesday and Thursday online and then everyone's online on Friday and the other group sort of switches. Um, and then obviously if something happens, they all switch to remote learning in that situation. If you look at the first year of the pandemic, so basically actually a little bit better than the first year. So from March until May, so March 2020 until May of 2021, uh, you can see the amount of province-wide closures that we had. And this is just the province-wide ones. This doesn't account for, I'll use Quebec as an example, which as you can see by the elementary one, uh, was only nine weeks and it was 10 weeks for the secondary one. Schools in Montreal and Quebec City were closed for an additional seven weeks on top of that. So while these numbers, you know, if you think about it, um, some of them were up as high as almost 20 weeks. 20 weeks is basically a third of the school year. I mean, we've got a 52 week year, we get what, 10 weeks off in the summer, so there's only 42 weeks in a school year. Uh, throw another week or two for Christmas, another week for Easter, uh, all the other stat holidays, another week, now we're down to about 35. And if you're missing in the case of, say, Alberta, 19 of those weeks, or Ontario, you know, you've missed over half the school year of, based on provincial closures, not counting the regional ones that are happening. Um, you can see here some of the things that they put in place the following year. So now this is year, the third school year of the pandemic to be impacted. So this is the fall of 2021 for the 21 and 22 school year. So basically roughly a year ago. Um, if you were to compare this table to the one for the fall of 2020, it looks about the same. Um, except for most of the public health stuff in this one has been taken out, whereas at least in fall of 2020, we had a lot more public health measures in place. So again, it was that idea of let's hope and pray that things are normal. And the reality becomes that, you know, we end up scrambling again. Um, the interesting thing at this stage is that many of these jurisdictions actually set up policies at the provincial level that prevented people from being able to even access remote learning as an option. Uh, so Quebec, they actually even went to court over it to determine whether or not um, only basically people who had pre-existing medical conditions who could get a doctor's note to sign off were allowed to learn fully online. Um, others had to make the decision to either learn fully online or in the classroom and regardless of what happened they weren't allowed to put in place remote learning plans. Um, so as I mentioned before and I know I'm running up on time and I don't want to get into Florence's time um, but um, I don't believe anyone made it to this toggle semester this level where the teachers the students the parents had the fidelity of experience to be able to move anywhere on this particular continuum uh, that you see here. Um, in terms of what we need to do to get to the uh, emerging new normal that's happening, uh, the first one I think is the most important one. If you think about the last three years of schooling, you think about the amount of time we've lost, the number of standards we haven't been able to cover. As a teacher, it would be really useful to know that, you know, if I'm teaching grade six, what grade five math competencies or objectives outcomes were absolutely critical for continuity of learning so that a student can actually understand grade six and what 
ones in grade six are absolutely necessary to understand grade seven. Because obviously I'm gonna have to reteach some grade five because we've lost a lot of time over the last three years. And because I've got to reteach that, and plus we might get disruption still yet again, I'm gonna have some time to be able to my grade six stuff. So I'm gonna to have to give up on some of that. Knowing what I need to make sure they have and what I can lose in this particular year so that they're ready for when they leave me is absolutely critical. And there's not a single jurisdiction in the entire world